Well, in churches, temples and mosques, they preach about the dangers of sin and the rewards of keeping to the path of righteousness. But not all religious people are good, not all good people are religious. There have been many humanitarians and philanthropists who are agnostic or atheist, from the philosophers the aforementioned David Hume, John Stuart Mill, to Microsoft's Bill Gates. The list is long. Do we need religion to create a moral society? Dr. Stephen Lowe, do we need, uh, Stephen Law, I do beg your pardon, do we need religion to create a moral society? That's the question. Yeah, I, I don't believe so, no. Uh, if you look at um, China, for about two millennia, it was a very moral place. Uh, their morality was based on Confucianism, um, which is a secular, non-religious doctrine. And yet you find more or less the same mm. moral codes. You find uh, the golden rule, do as you would be done by, for example. Confucius, that was his message too, not just Jesus. So you find societies that are very moral, uh, that have similar levels of morality to religious societies, such as Europe under Christianity. Um, so it's just a straightforward counterexample to the claim that you can't have a moral society without a religious foundation. So does morality predate religion? I, I don't know. You'll have to ask a scientist. <laughs> An evolutionary. I think they both ha clearly have deep roots in our history, yeah. and to some extent it looks as if there's a genetic component perhaps mm. to both mm. of those tendencies that we have to be moral and to lean towards religion. To I be think. pattern seekers, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Bishop David, do you, do you believe I think morality comes from God? Yeah, I do. do. But then do. I believe in God. So clearly that people who want to live a moral life or create a moral framework can choose to do so without God. What is needed is a framework that human beings flourish, and we know this from our vulnerability as, as, as tiny children, uh, with a framework. And that there is some basic understandings of right and wrong, of what is true, is not true, what, what is the right way to treat with each other. Uh, we've touched on that already. But one We're not individuals. As we establish week after week, one, one person's morality is another person's bigotry. And this is a very common problem today that we start to make it up as we go along. And it's interesting to talk about Confucianism and the Chinese government's present interest in understanding what is the framework that a human being who's now entered into the free market, who's now uh, trying to aspire to their own house, to their own family life, what is the moral framework? And that's why Christianity is booming in China at the moment, for example, because people seek not only just their ordinary physical and safety needs, but they also need spiritual nourishment. And so the roots of much of our morality today are, of course, and we talked about the law courts as well this morning, are rooted in an understanding that we need a framework and that people connect that up, not just with logic and, and measurable things, but also with the things of the spirit. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, I, I think that what's most important is that we produce uh, good citizens. And the kind of citizen that I would want to hold up as a model would be, say, the kind of citizens who rescue Jews during the Holocaust. Uh, now, research has been done into the backgrounds of those individuals, and it turns out that what really motivated those individuals was not religious belief, in fact. They didn't appear to be much more religious than those that didn't rescue. What marks out the rescuers from the non-rescuers is that they were raised to think and question and think about things from the other points of view. To do the right thing for the right reasons. Yeah, to dis certainly to discuss openly and not just uncritically and passively accept mm. whatever they were told. Mm. Now, you can raise children like that within a religious setting. It's not incompatible with religion, mm. but you can also do it outside of a religious setting. And it turns out it doesn't ma matter very much whether you do it inside religion or outside, as long as you're doing that. That's the most important thing. So. Mm. So, uh, do you believe a fear of God is necessary? Not necessarily. I mean, I actually agree with Stephen that you use the word genetic, maybe there's a genetic component, that we believe as Muslims that God has actually created human beings with moral understanding within them. So we know things, certain things are not right, some, certain things are, not, are wrong. So we do have that moral compass within us that we are born with. But human beings and our rationale, which is wonderful, our intellect is wonderful, but it's fallible. We are you know, swayed by things around us. And if we look at the way 
society today has become so consumer driven and so obsessive about happily wasting the world's resources and you know there was a time when our intellect told us it's perfectly okay for a white person to treat a black person as inferior because a black person is inferior and that was our intellect that we can treat a woman slavery as wasn't as a, a monopoly of of white people, though, there was, oh, there's okay. been slavery well, since well, time well, immemorial. The point is yeah. about intellect. Yeah, yeah. The intellect though. told us it's perfectly yeah, yeah. acceptable to treat women. Yeah, it's it's really really slavery is mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned it's, in the Bible. It's, so it's not just mentioned, yeah. it, it is, it is uh, overtly allowed within these texts. It's forbidden in so it, it, it's, not, it's not, certainly within the Bible. So, it, and that's another part of the Old Testament that somehow gets revised so that we can ignore that whilst paying attention to Leviticus 20. Uh, so, um, <laughs> The, the reality is that I'm not suggesting that, that we don't owe some debt to uh, especially Abrahamic religions for disseminating uh, some very de general mm. ideas of, of what I think are basic humanist principles and making people who perhaps not, would not otherwise have, have obeyed them, obey them. But the fact is now, if we're saying do we need it religion now to be a moral society, I think that, that would suggest that we are somehow regressive creatures that we are, instead of evolving, we're going backwards. No, we, are we do backwards. not need that. We are going backwards. Are going backwards. Uh, Michael? We are going backwards. Look at society. Look at our youngsters. I would need something it... more specific. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to give you specifics, do you? Yes. Okay, you look at the, the rate of uh, youngsters what are now got no um, husbands, no father figures, the kids what are uh, on our streets who are who are having children. Ch it says in the Bible that children will start having children. Can you point to a because, better time, because, uh, Michael? Because they're leaning away from what the Bible... But are we suggesting... Would, would, hang on, could you, Michael, can you point to a, a better time than now, a golden age, when things were better and there was proper adherence to what you believe in I, and, well, and society was resultantly better? A lot of my... For instance, my grandparents' age, a lot of them, you know, they've been married, you know, the best part of 50, 60 years. They've had one partner. The, the children are all... You know, they've got the mother there, they've got the dad there, they're married. It's, it's, in, that con it's in the convenience of the church, it's, it's consecrated by God. And, and because of the upbringings of the, of the mother and the father, the child's got a better chance of striving. Well, now I'm not saying that single parents are going to be struggling, are going to be struggling to bring up their child. But what I do say is that if you are uh, married and you have your son and your, or your daughter and you've got a father and your mother, then you've got a better chance of striving. John? I, I'm not sure that there's any statistics that suggest that Christians are somehow staying married more than atheists, for I'm example, if that's what we're suggesting, or secular people. I don't think that's the case. Yes, of course, some of the things you're saying are true, but the idea that the only variable between uh, the time when every family was together and there were picket fences and, and moderate wealth for everybody and this time now of near Armageddon that's being suggested is just the decline of religion. That it's not. There are so many other factors. Of course there are. But don't you agree with that? Uh, 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 Miriam, sorry, Miriam was being I just wanted to come back to, to something that Hola and Stephen were touching on, which is that uh, morals can be exceeded by the use of reason. And in fact, in Islam, the use of critical mm. reason is very much encouraged. The, the difference is that you've got no way to then ground that within society and the individual. And that's where religion plays a role because yes. through ritual it connects the individual to broader society. When you pray, you reconnect with those godly values, which are the universal values of morality. When you fast, you think about poor people. All of these rituals, charity, you think about your connectedness to others. All of these rituals are there to connect you to other people. And all the research suggests that actually, research by Putnam recently, religious institutions, religious organizations are much better at creating civic uh, networks. That, you know, the Oxford Handbook of Religion recently showed that religious Americans are much better at being civic activists, at voting, at giving to so Charity. is that a moral society? Because it's, there's, it's, there's a most religious society in the Western world. Is that a particular paragon of morality, America? See, one of these things, are, you can't, well, sociologists generally find it very difficult to me measure religiosity of a society. Well, you can measure the religiosity. The USA is the most religious society in, Western, well, in the Western world. Well, that's one sociological definition. What, what's much easier to measure is um, self proclaimed religiosity. So how much you attend church, how often you give to charity, how often you pray. And that is very much connected with civic activism and looking after others. It's no surprise that one in ten young people in Britain today feel that they have no responsibility yeah. for the elderly. Yeah. That yeah. religious people it's, feel um, that because they yeah. connect yeah.
There's a, lot of, there's a lot to respond to in there, and some of it's right. Um, I think it's true. The religion. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll get to the bits, but not right in a minute. I mean, get, so cut, for cut example, to the chase, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, religion is actually a very good social adhesive. It's quite good at binding people together into communities, and no one wants to deny that. However, it's also true, for example, that if you run philosophy for children programs in schools, those those children are also transformed. They become far more moral, far more interested in interacting with each other, but it's the and they think. So you can about. build communities yeah. using religion, or you can build religion. You can build communities without using religion. The thing about the philosophical approach, let me finish. Yeah. The thing about the philosophical approach is that everyone is included. You don't have the effect of different religions as they bind people together. Mm -hmm. They produce divi divisions well, that's, between that's those communities. That's an assumption communities. you're making in Islam. You say very much. You're, someone is either your equal in faith or they're your brother in humanity. We don't. Those distinctions. Susan, that you're Susan making, wants to come in here. Susan. I'm just going to say I, I, I like what you're saying, but I don't agree with it actually because if you look. If, if we took religion out of it, then it would be one man's word over another man's word of what morality is. Yes. You could state that you think this is moral, and then I could state something yeah, else. There's a really good example of that, what we were work. talking about earlier on, which is you, you, think, it's, you think all women, who, all, all Muslim women should wear the hijab, for example. Mm. Right, it's a lady there who doesn't, so is she being immoral? No, I don't think so. But you told me I earlier on it was a, a sin, not... But this is my personal belief and that's her person. Mm. I'm not her. I don't know how she thinks. We... I don't know how she feels. I don't know her life story. I don't know when she was born, where she was born. I don't even know her full name. But I don't you know think her all age. Women should, we... All women should wear the hijab. That's, that's, that's an example of exactly general, what you were saying about one person's morality. My general, but I also believe that, that uh, women who have some disability that can't ha wear the hijab shouldn't wear the hijab mm. and I think there are there are plenty of reasons why that should be I mean this is my personal my, my personal belief that I don't believe in enforcing it on anybody it's and that's not... the point that's where we get back to it most religions are actually involved in civic networks in which they're helping to feed the poor look after the elderly mm. they're buttressing where the state is actually yeah. failing us and without them we'd be a lot poorer they're also really? massively involved in politics in which case yeah. they also do things like try and prevent gay people from adopting yeah. trying to stop them from having that's codified right. relationships etc yeah, yeah. etc yeah, et so it's not they're not just this benign uh, activity. Uh, Anthony, Anthony. The, question is, the question is slightly flawed in that. Oh, you know, sorry about that. I, 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 I agree with you. Because, <laughs> you know, does religion bring a more moral yeah. society? Well, even if it does, do we always want to have a more moral society if you're then condemning people you consider to be immoral yeah. to be out of society? Yeah. In other words, one person's definition of morality is, is another person's immorality. In other words, said, true, yeah. whether it's religious during the or not. Crusades, <laughs> The Crusades for Morality persecuted, killed lots of people who were deemed to be immoral. In a born-again uh, Christian sense, homosexuality is immoral. In my view, I'm, some of the most moral people I've ever met in my life have been homosexuals. I'm not, listen, I'm not saying I've got a problem. Well, let's not go back to we've, 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 we've kind of, yeah. <laughs> we've kind of been there. But there but, is a point, I mean, Carla, you can address this one. There's a point that we look at, we look at the, the history of re religion, uh, and it is drenched in blood and it's drenched in inhumanity. The Middle East is all about ancient religious claims to a strip of it's land. All, it's all about politics, it's all about gas, it's about oil. And um, Stalin and Mao... Yes, it is. Stalin and Mao were not religious people. So it's nothing to do with religion. Do you know what that is, it is fair to say that there is a tremendous amount of politics. But what's amazing to me is that, on the one hand, religion is this powerful, amazing entity. And on the other hand, the moment anything bad happens within it, that's politics. No, you have to take some responsibility. You asked before, what's the difference between a moral structure that has God at the top of it and one that doesn't? The difference is when God is your superego, when God is that person on your shoulder backing you up with everything you say, all of a sudden your words have double, more, maybe more, the impact. Well, actually, your swears cultivate humility. John, Bishop David. John's no. usually has a much greater insight into the Almighty than, than, than perhaps I do. But I would not say that. <laughs> much, much, much... Uh, I haven't seen Much you play basketball. Bigger relationship. No, no, I, I, I prefer rugby. But the main thing about uh, this, this agenda is that human beings need to live together in harmony. They need to see creative flourishing, whoever they are, whatever their background, colour, creed. And at the same time, uh, we need to allow for the flourishing of that extraordinary thing in human beings which seeks the other which seeks the numinous, the description of love, for example, is, is extremely difficult to measure, but raises the spirit. Christians find that love in the person of Jesus, face to face, 
and also in the ability to sort things out when things go wrong. We've mentioned all sorts of negative things today. That is one of the basic experiences of human beings. And therefore, the ability to be forgiven and to know you're forgiven, to know that you can forgive in order to pick up and move on, is at the heart of many people's religious practice. What about those people who are, who are, you know, unarguably wonderful people, altruistic people, but do it not because there is a creator or they believe there is a creator, but do it just because they think it's the right thing to do. I, I say praise the Lord. And, uh, I but think they don't. I think, <laughs> no, they no, don't say and, praise and the therefore, Lord. Therefore, an understanding, a Christian understanding of God <laughs> is, is, as we say, is big enough yeah. To uh, uh, encompass to the encompass whole those people too. Stephen, you want to find a word? Yeah. I, I think that each one of us ultimately has the responsibility for making our own moral decisions. Yes. And we need the inner resources that, to, you know, to fall back on to make those kinds of decisions. And religion can help us. And I, I have no problem with religion whatsoever in terms of providing guidance, but you need to reflect on it and ultimately make your own decision. You should not treat your religion as a moral compass that you must always follow blindly and unthinking. Moral compass? I haven't thing. heard that word for a couple of years. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. And where do our notions of right and wrong come from? Well, clearly they've been drummed into us by evolution, that the product of these apish urges and, and social emotions, and then they get modulated by culture. <laughs> so this, 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 this idea of that morality comes merely from the mere issuance of a competent authority, what, one of the features of psychopathy is an inability to distinguish true moral precepts that relate to the well-being of, of people and things that merely issue from a competent authority. So if you, if you ask children sitting in a classroom, is it okay to drink a soda in class if the teacher gives you permission? Most of them will say yes. If you, if you ask them, is it okay to punch your neighbor in the face if the teacher gives you permission? They immediately recognize the distinction between a moral infraction and, and uh, uh, a mere conventional rule. And this, and this is very young children. But children at risk for psychopathy don't. Children at risk for psychopathy think that rules are just given by an authority. So if the teacher tells you you can punch a child in the face, you can punch a child in the face. Um, this is, again, I'm not accusing religious people in general of being psychopaths, but there is there's a psychopathic core to this moral worldview. This divine command theory that Dr. Craig is advocating suggests that if God only tells you to sacrifice your firstborn son, it is good to do it. Uh, that's where goodness comes from. And so you've got, you've got people waking up in trailer parks all over America, suffering some form of mental illness that's, that's destabilized them and made them vulnerable to this way of thinking. And there are people who kill their children thinking they're Abraham who just didn't get uh, uh, interrupted by an angel. Um, my question is for Professor Dawkins. Considering that uh, atheism cannot possibly have any sense of absolute morality, would it not then be an irrational leap of faith, which atheists themselves so harshly condemn, for an atheist to decide between right and wrong? <coughs> Absolute morality, the, the, the absolute morality that a religious person might profess would include what? Stoning people for adultery? Death for apostasy? Uh, punishment for breaking the Sabbath? These are all things which are religiously based absolute moralities. I don't think I want an absolute morality. I think I want a morality that, that is thought out, reasoned, argued, discussed, and based upon, I could almost say, intelligent design. Um, <laughs> can we not design our society which has the sort of morality, the sort of society that, that we want to live in? If you actually look at the the moralities that are accepted among modern people, among 21st century people. We don't believe in slavery anymore. We believe in equality of women. Um, we believe in, in being gentle. We believe in being kind to animals. These are all things which are entirely recent. They have very little basis in biblical or Quranic scripture. They are, th they are things that have developed over historical time through a consensus of reasoning, sober, discussion, argument, legal theory, 
political and moral philosophy. These do not come from religion. To the extent that you can find the good bits in religious scriptures, you have to cherry pick. You, you search your way through the Bible or the Quran and you find the occasional verse that is a, an acceptable profession of morality. And you say, look at that, that's religion. And you leave out all the horrible bits. <laughs> And you say, oh, we don't believe that anymore. We've grown out of that. Well, of course we've grown out of it. We've grown out of it because of secular moral philosophy and rational discussion. Not only just their ordinary physical and safety needs, but they also need spiritual nourishment. And so the roots of much of our morality today are, of course, and we talked about the law courts as well this morning, are rooted in an understanding that we need a framework and that people connect that up, not just with logic, and, and measurable things, but also with the things of the spirit. Stephen. Yeah, I, I think that what's most important is that we produce uh, good citizens. And the kind of citizen that I would want to hold up as a model would be, say, the kind of citizens who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Uh, now, research has been done into the backgrounds of those individuals, and it turns out... Well, in churches, temples and mosques, they preach about the dangers of sin and the rewards of keeping to the path of righteousness. But not all religious people are good, not all good people are religious. There have been many humanitarians and philanthropists who are agnostic or atheist, from the philosophers the aforementioned David Hume, John Stuart Mill, to Microsoft's Bill Gates. The list is long. Do we need religion to create a moral society? Dr. Stephen Lowe, do we need... Uh, Stephen Law, I do beg your pardon. Do we need religion to create a moral society? That's the question. Yeah, I, I don't believe so, no. Uh, if you look at um, China <laughs> and evolution, I think they both ha clearly have deep roots in our history, yeah. and to some extent it looks as if there's a genetic component, perhaps, mm. to both mm. of those tendencies that we have to be moral and to lean towards religion. To I be think. pattern seekers, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Bishop David. Do you, do you believe I think morality comes from God? Yeah, I do. do. But then I believe in God. So clearly that people who want to live a moral life or create a moral framework can choose to do so without God. What is needed is a framework that human beings flourish, and we know this from our vulnerability as, as, as tiny children, uh, with a framework. And that there is... China, for about two millennia, was a very moral place. Uh, their morality was based on Confucianism, um, which is a secular, non-religious doctrine. And yet you find more or less the same mm. moral codes. You find uh, the golden rule, do as you would be done by, for example. Confucius, that was his message too, not just Jesus. So you find societies that are very moral, uh, that have similar levels of morality to religious societies, such as Europe under Christianity. Um, so it's just a straightforward counterexample to the claim that you can't have a moral society without a religious foundation. So does morality predate religion? I, I don't know. You'll have to ask a scientist. <laughs> Some basic understandings of right and wrong, what is true, what is not true, what, what is the right way to treat with each other. Uh, we've touched on that already. But We're not individuals. About, well, as we establish week after week, one, one person's morality is another person's bigotry. And this is a very common problem today that we start to make it up as we go along and it's interesting to talk about Confucianism and the Chinese government's present interest in understanding what is the framework that a human being who's now entered into the free market, who's now uh, trying to aspire to their own house, to their own family life, what is the moral framework and that's why Christianity is booming in China at the moment, for example, because people see 